Welcome to the June Java User Group. Um, I'm Dan, this is Jonathan. Uh, we like to go around the room just really quickly and get everybody to introduce themselves. Just your name, what you do at Java, and um, keep notes if there's anybody else you want to talk to after the meeting, somebody who says something that interests you, make sure you keep, uh, keep track so you can connect. This is the slide we put up every month. Um, lets you know we've got a mailing list. We've got a meetup group, which is maybe how you've found us. Uh, we video record these meetings. We post them up to our website. So if you miss something or you want to share it with a friend, you can send a link. And um, we do have a mailing list that has job postings. So if you're looking for Java developers or you want, you can, you can sign up for this mailing list. And uh, I moderate it pretty heavily, and it only has Toronto Java jobs traffic. I get lots of posts for like SAP developers in New Jersey, and I just, those, those, don't, get, those, those don't make it through the filter because they don't, they don't meet the three obvious criteria. Uh, and uh, we've got a deal from O'Reilly for the uh, Java user group. So uh, if you use this promo code, you get cheap ebooks from O'Reilly, which is actually a really good deal, and they've got lots of good content. I think it covers their whole catalog. So that's pretty cool. So Java news this month. Um, this is kind of related. Um, the Ask Toolbar uh, versions that aren't the latest one have been classified as malware by Microsoft, and they're removed by Windows Defender. Um, so if, uh, if Oracle has installed it for you, Microsoft will remove it for you, which is, <laughs> which is really great. Um, but, but fortunately, Oracle stopped doing this. Uh, th uh, they've recently removed the Ask toolbar from the JRE install bundle, uh, which, because we're developers, we probably haven't seen it. But if you go to java.com and click the consumer download Java button, you get, you get this, and it tries to take over your whole computer, and it's really horrible. Oh, yeah, it's really retro. So it doesn't, doesn't do this anymore. But <laughs> <laughs> they've, they've replaced it with another program that sets all of your default search to Yahoo. So it, it runs in the background and like, tries to make sure your, everything that it can find is defaulted to Yahoo if you let it. It's very, very, very exciting. Um, <laughs> so it might be a little bit less malware than the Ask Toolbar. I don't think it like sends as much of your private data over the internet, and you know it's not quite as horrible, but it still probably shouldn't be any thing installed with Java. It should just install Java, in my opinion, anyway. And that's this is my opinion slide. If you find JRE, just get it off whatever computer you find it on, because it you shouldn't be having the Java plugin. It's not good. It's don't don't write Java so web. Microsoft the JRE is <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, that wouldn't won't be long. I, it might with old versions. I'm not sure. But um, yeah, don't make applets. <laughs> Just please, <laughs> please don't. <laughs> if you find yeah, if you find it on your parents' computer, just uninstall it. That's right. Yeah. Distribute that way because you don't have to put the ask toolbar in your own. Yeah, that's right. If you're if you're you putting your Java your app on like the, um, <laughs> you can also publish Java apps to the Mac App Store. Uh, there's a certain bundling method that you you put the JRE with it and the right manifest and everything else, and you can actually sell it on the Mac App Store. Full. It's actually, yeah, even the tool that comes with the JDK now that does it for you. Yeah. 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 Magic Mac App Bundler. So, very cool. Uh, this is Java 9 news. Um, there's a recent proposal to make the G1 garbage collector the default, which is pretty cool. It's, uh, it's very high tech. And um, it's, uh, it's their low legacy, uh, low latency garbage collector. And they're worried that it may not be well enough tested. So they're going to evaluate that. And they're going to evaluate whether or not it's needed. Um, but they're hopefully going to make it the default, which is going to be a great modernization for Java. Uh, the legacy OpenJDK 7 project is now going to be managed by Red Hat, because I guess they have a lot of customers that depend on it and aren't super happy with Oracle completely dropping support for it. 
So they're going to be a safe way to get open JDK 7 and probably recent security patches and everything else. And they're going to um, sort of help maintain the open source project. Um, I found this blog post from someone at Oracle with uh, some exciting new JSF frameworks. I don't know if any of you use JSF at all, uh, but the new 2.2, 2.3 looking pretty good. And these frameworks let you use modern web technologies with it. Um, we use prime phases at work for a lot of stuff. And it's, it's not bad. It's getting maybe a little bit old. But I mean, these are using Bootstrap, jQuery, all kinds of new tech with JSF. So it might be a neat way to do web apps. Um, there's been a lot of talk on the blogosphere this month. I don't know if you've been following Twitter and a few sort of Java pundits and people are bouncing back and forth whether it's cooler to do <coughs> microservices or to do monolithic apps and what's easier, where you should start, whether you should start from one and go to the other or back or um, different ways to deal with it. So Google it. There's lots of neat stuff out there. And if you're thinking of doing a large application and looking for ways to structure it, you'll probably find some good advice. Or at least end up confused, <laughs> one or the other. So that's the Java news that I found for this month. I don't know if anybody else has anything else, releases of projects you're working on, Eclipse. things like that. Eclipse. Uh, yeah. The new Eclipse? Eclipse. Awesome. I haven't been new Eclipse Mars? No. Yeah, I haven't been using it for a while, but that's, that's awesome. What's, what's new with it? Uh, one of the things was better. Gradle support? Yeah. That's awesome. Yep. Supposedly improved performance and stability. Oh, uh, nested project view. So if you have Maven projects that yeah. depend on other Maven projects, they show up in the correct. Network. Oh, that's super cool. Yeah. <laughs> Finally. Yeah. Yeah, because it got Maven support in the last upgrade, right? Official built in. On by default, yeah. 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 Uh, Scala 11.7 came out yesterday. Scala 11.7? Okay. All right, so I'm going to hand the stage over to Donnie for his presentation on Will It Compile. And uh, thank you, everybody, for coming. So for those of you who don't know, um, the presentation today is I've created a quiz with 10 questions. Um, each of them is a code sample. And all you have to do is determine whether or not it will compile. Um, just to explain a bit about how I came up with these questions and to set your expectation for the difficulty, I want to tell you about um, what I did to make them. Um, so first a bit about me. I've been using Java for quite a while. I've used it at almost all the jobs that I've had, um, except the last one, in lots of side projects. I did the Sun Certified Java Programmer exam for Java 1.4 more than 10 years ago, and I've been using Java most of the time since then. And all that is just to say that I thought I knew Java pretty well. And then I spent a weekend reading the Java language specification. <laughs> and I took lots of notes. I read it very carefully, and I made notes about all the things that it had that I didn't expect or that were surprising to me. And um, what surprised me the most was that there wasn't just runtime behavior that I didn't really understand. There was compile time behavior that I didn't understand. And not just like what the compiler did, you know, like the <coughs> bytecode that it made, but just the simplest question of here's some code, should this or shouldn't this compile? And I found that there were lots of places where I would get it wrong. So I took all those notes and I turned them into some hopefully very challenging questions. The problem with making questions like these is that really the output is just will it compile, yes or no. So it's not like puzzlers where I can use multiple choice output. I've still tried my best to like trick you into you know, doing the wrong thing, picking the wrong answer. But it's still, if you ignored all that and just guessed, then you would get you know, 5 out of 10 right because it's 50-50. And I think that that's too high. So in addition to making these questions, I also have my own scoring mechanism oh. where <laughs> the bar is a little bit higher than knowing whether or not it will compile. Because if you knew even a few questions, then just by guessing the rest of them, you could get 6 or 7 or 8 out of 10. And that's way too high. So <coughs> the scoring, you only get full credit if you know the answer, sorry, you, you get the correct answer, 
and you basically knew it already. So you don't have to know everything about it already, but it does have to be more than just kind of an educated guess or a hunch. Like you should have some level of understanding about why it does or doesn't compile. If you get it right, but it was just an educated guess or you can't really explain why, then you only get partial credit. You get 0 0.1 points. <laughs> the, the scale drops off very quickly, yes. <laughs> And the other part is that uh, I wish I didn't have to tell you this because it's basically a hint, but to explain the scoring properly, um, there might be multiple things that cause it to not compile or multiple things that are kind of suspicious and regularly wouldn't compile but happen to compile just because of the circumstances of the question. If you miss one of those reasons, then you still just get 0 0.1 points. You have to get it right and get all of them correct. Thanks. And if you get it wrong, then obviously you get uh, zero. So a few rules. Uh, <laughs> after I ask the question, I'm going to do a show of hands for who thinks it will compile and uh, who thinks it won't compile. And you have to put your hand up for one of them. Usually I'm the kind of person who would rather not answer if I didn't know the answer. But I've been to a presentation like this before, and it's a lot more fun if you try. So when the time is up, I can give you a bit more time if you need it. But when that is up, you have to put your hand up for one. And I'm going to watch to see who doesn't put their hand up for anything. So if, if you get it wrong, there's no penalty for the scoring. But if you don't answer at all, then you will be publicly shamed by me and by everyone here. So you have to answer. Um, also, after I put the question up, uh, please be quiet. It's just too easy to overhear people talk about stuff um, and you ruin it for people around you. And it's just easier to think if it's quiet. The last one, pretty much everyone has a beer. Yeah, not often. Uh, yeah, if you have a beer, drink when you're wrong. Even if you don't, you can still drink, join in. Just get super hydrated by the end. <laughs> Uh, a bit of detail, so all the code is complete. That means that excluding the header at the top where I have, you know, question one, question two, you should be able to take exactly what I have on the screen, put it in a file called question.java in the default package, so no name package, and compile it, and it will either compile or not compile. Um, there are also line numbers on the side in uh, some parts. Uh, for references, sometimes I'll make reference to the Java language spec. All these are for the JLS 7. I think that the, the references, they try to keep the numbers the same between most of them, but just in case. And also, this behavior is not kind of like weird corner case behavior that only exists in, you know, some of the time. I tested this on all these compilers that I listed, so all the way back to the Sun JDK for Java 5, uh, through OpenJDK 1.6, 1.7, the Eclipse Incremental Compiler, as well as the latest uh, Oracle JDK 1.8. So this is not weird behavior, this is behavior that this is how Java actually is and has been for a long time. So, uh, any questions about scoring or about any of this stuff before we get on to the first question? Should we bring around shots? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, apparently Street Context is buying shots for everybody. <laughs> Thank you. All right, first question. I'll give you, I don't know, about 30 seconds or 45 seconds for each one, and I'll give you time after. If you need a bit more time and you think it will help, uh, I'll ask for that as well. So, let's start. Laughter and expressions of, you know, struggle are okay. <laughs> Okay, does anybody want more time and think it will help? <laughs> Do we need to answer that question or no? <laughs> <laughs> you, you were allowed to answer that question. Yes. <laughs> no, no points for answering that question. Um, okay, so let's do a show of hands and everyone has to participate. So who thinks this will compile? Hands up. Okay, about 40%. Uh, and who thinks it won't compile? Should be everybody else. <laughs> yeah. And the answer is this will not compile. Uh, 
So first, the, uh, the part that's OK is that weird syntax of new A and then lots of curly braces. That's actually OK. That's just a, uh, a block inside of an initializer block. And you can put um, arbitrary numbers of curly braces in many places, and it's fine. Um, you're just declaring a block. You can put them in methods, whatever. Or in this case, it's just outside of the class. You can put curly braces, and you happen to have a block inside of that. So that part is OK. The part that doesn't work is having an interface inside of a non-static inner class. JLS says inner classes may not declare uh, member interfaces, or you get a compile time error. <laughs> There's no real, uh, um, no strict explanation why. It's just, nope, too bad. It doesn't work. <laughs> yeah, I, I hear a lot of 0.1s around here. That's a beer. <laughs> All right. Next question. We'll give another 15 seconds. <laughs> Anyone want more time? <laughs> nope, okay. So let's do a show of hands. Hands up if you think this will compile. Almost everybody. All right, uh, hands down. Hands up if you think it won't compile. Is that a hand? One, two, two people? The answer is this will not oh. compile. Oh. <laughs> yes! Uh, yep. Our construction worker gets it right. Good man. Yeah, you got it right. So, good man. Good job. You just have people who are really. Yep. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I, I like this because I think that the almost the more you know about Java, the more you expect that it will compile. Um, this question, this is a bit embarrassing for me, but I, I made these questions a long time ago, and then only recently I went and kind of put them in this presentation. And when I did that, I went through all the questions that I had to make sure they were hard enough. And I marked this question saying that it was too simple because, like, obviously it should compile. And, and I was going to take it out, but I checked first <laughs> and saw that it didn't compile. So, you know, there, there's lots of reasons why you think it should compile, which is if you know about how the class is encoded in bytecode, um, you know that the inner class gets written as just outer dollar inner. Um, the JVM has no knowledge about inner classes. That's all done by the Java compiler. So it seems like it should work. Uh, and the syntax as well, you might think that you, not, you can't reference the inner versus outer, but you can if you just use fully qualified class names. But the JLS says, too bad, uh, it's an error if you have the same simple name as any of your enclosing classes. Um, by the way, the, this does work in Scala. Scala encodes inner classes similarly to Java, yeah. and it allows this. <laughs> um, but the, the JLS says, too bad, you can't have it. I, I think probably because they think it would be too confusing having inner uh, classes that have the same name. But anyway, it doesn't compile. Next question. Does anyone want more time? No? Okay. Show of hands, who thinks this will compile? Uh, no. 25%, a few more are joining in. Okay, hands down. And people who think that it won't compile, it has to be everybody else. Okay, good. I'm undecided. Undecided. No, no undecided. You're in the. No, you 
negative points for undecided. Well, no negative <laughs> points, but <laughs> shaming for undecided. <laughs> Answer is that this does compile. So that there is some really similar code like this that wouldn't compile. Um, for example, if you had a class instead of an interface, lines three and five wouldn't compile, but line four would compile. Um, I'll explain that soon. If you had made it a static inner class, then all of them, all the parts compile. And the reasoning is that, there's a rule, inner classes cannot declare static members unless they are constant variables, meaning marked final, and nested classes that are not inner classes, meaning static inner classes, um, can declare static members freely. But back to the problem of we have an interface, the reason why this does compile is because just about everything inside of an interface is implicitly static and public. So including the member type, the, the inner class, is implicitly static, so it's fine. You don't want it. The chance of them being three in a row that didn't go. <laughs> 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 Uh, the, the psychological technique, sure, you, you get 0 0.1 points for getting a correct but not knowing why. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Next question. Does anybody need more time? Feel free to speak up if you need more time. No? Okay. Show of hands, who think this compiles? Only a few people who think this won't compile? Mm. Almost everybody? A anyone care to venture? Why doesn't this compile? Anyone confident enough? Kind of right block that catches <coughs> exception. Like you, you've got to have something that throws it the checked exception. Try block that catches exception is like invalid. A checked exception. You can't. A checked exception. You try, try block that catches a checked exception that isn't thrown by that try block. Yes. Well, very close. The answer is that this doesn't compile. And it is quite close to what you've said. So almost everyone knows the rule that uh, if you have a block of code that can throw an exception, then you have to either declare that, you, sorry, a checked exception, then you have to either declare that you throw it or have a catch block for it or a superclass. But there is actually the inverse rule as well, which is that if a block of code can't throw a checked exception, you are not allowed to catch it unless <laughs> unless you catch exception itself or a superclass, so throwable. So still 0 0.1 for you, because, <laughs> because the only part that doesn't compile here is line 5, the catch IO exception. Catch exception is fine, but it's the, uh, the checked exception that is not exception itself. And the abstract nothing to do with it. Oh yeah, sorry, the, the abstract class and the static block inside of it, nothing to do with it, <laughs> just to distract you for fun. All right, next question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can give you more time. Anyone need more time? Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I've got some practical tips in later questions for uh, useful code you can write. All right, last call. Anyone need? Anyone still need more time? I can do it. Okay, more time. Another 15 seconds. Five more seconds. 
everyone can make up their minds. Okay, show of hands, who thinks this will compile? Two, two people, okay, and who thinks it won't compile? Everyone hands up. And I see you. You didn't put your hand up. Did you? Okay, okay. For, for will compile or won't compile? Oh, okay. My mistake. Actually, anyone who thinks that this uh, won't compile since you were in the majority care to say why? My guess is the, um, it's a guess, so I'm going to get a point on I guess. Uh, <laughs> Going from a list of something that extends integer back out to a float, I don't think will work. A list of something that extends integer to a float. Last line there, the for float f. Good guess, maybe. Anyone else have a anyone else have a reason? Different reason? Well, I said it compile because even though there's overflow there, I mean it'll still assign it to some value. And you still think it will compile? It will okay. And it could, it, it could have just implicitly cast it to a float. Yeah, Actually, possibly. Wait, Integer is fine for the as a class. So you also can't extend integer. I'm not sure the best. But that's generics, right? The generics will let you do Yeah, generics don't care about that part. But, yeah. Still, the answer is this won't compile. But the reasoning here, so first the, uh, the easy one, that one, multiple brackets are fine. Um, that number is the smallest number representable by integers. And so a side note is that when you negate it, you still get negative that number. You can't turn that positive because you can't represent it. Um, but that part is still fine. This part is actually okay. What happens is that uh, that whole block is turned into an iterator over it and um, the thing, things that extend integer, you can cast them to integer. That can then be turned into an int primitive, which can then be widened to a float. So that part is still fine. And I also want to know that this is actually an example that they use in the JLS. Um, but the iterator integer part actually won't compile, and they, they show that code is what it was, will turn into. But it's basically OK um, if you know about variants of the all generics are invariant, but that's actually okay because you're only reading from it. So um, it's even though it doesn't compile strictly, it's the code is basically fine. The reason why it doesn't compile is the very first line: the question t extends integer. The JLS says that it is an error to extend <laughs> to, to have a class that is generic that extends any subclass of throwable. And they, they go on to say that uh, the restriction is needed since the catch mechanism of the JVM works only with non-generic classes. <laughs> but I tried that when, when I read that, then I tried it out. Uh, I made a class in Scala, a generic class that extended exception, and it compiled. And then I tried throwing it and catching it, and it worked. And I disassembled the code and verified that, yes, it was actually a class that was generic, that extended uh, exception. And so at least on the JVM I was using, you can do that but maybe uh, not all of them can. All right, next question. Anyone need more time? No? Okay. Show of hands, who thinks this will compile? A few people are hesitating. Okay. And who thinks it won't compile? About 80 or 90%. Oh, okay. Anyone who uh, thinks it won't compile wants to tell me why? Float. The long to float. I think that won't compile. Okay. Anyone else have other reasons? Can't redefine float A. Can't redefine float A. Can't redefine float A defined twice. Float A defined twice. Looks like that, doesn't it? <laughs> Let, let's check. So I, I've taken the liberty of uh, copy and pasting this question over. 
uh, here I have a long A, float A. I have a second float A, and this compiles. I, I've changed it to static so that I can print them out in a main, just to prove to you that uh, we get two different values for float A, float A. And I can actually even add a third one over here. I can create a Unicode character you guys want in there. And the reason is that, yes, what you pointed out, I have some crazy Unicode characters going on here. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the uh, the letter A up here is the uh, the regular Latin capital alpha, but the A down here is obviously the Greek sorry the capital A the, the Greek capital alpha, and down here we have the Cyrillic capital A. <laughs> Three distinct characters. <laughs> But there's actually even more that you can do. So identifiers in Java, you can have um, a large number of Unicode characters. There's actually a really cool uh, Unicode character called the um, Combining Grapheme Joiner, which I will demonstrate to you here. <laughs> the Combining Grapheme Joiner is a invisible character that takes up no space <laughs> and is a valid Unicode character. So down here I have a variety of things named AB because they have different numbers of combining graphing joiners between them. You can even do things like have what looks like a keyword. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if, I, uh, if I cursor over these, you can see uh, I'm cursoring left, 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 and then it goes through. So again, you can go through and I have different numbers. Yeah. <laughs> and as you saw before, there's lots of uh, fun Unicode characters you can use, things that look like quotes, um, which are just double primes, they're valid, triangle, a uh, slanty happy face. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see one. Unfortunately, I didn't see one. But that, this is what I mentioned when I when I talked about some practical things you can take away from this presentation. Oh yeah, nice. There's now a Unicode. Maybe it's a valid character. That wasn't really fair. Wasn't fair. I didn't say I was going to make fair questions. I said I was going to make hard questions. I think we should I stand by my previous comment. <laughs> Boom. Can we see the code in the hex representation? Yeah. You should have another beer to ease the pain. Yeah, you should. Uh, so the, the parts that do compile, the uh, 1E10, that's just floating point literals, those are fine. The um, long to double is a widening conversion. And also long to float is also a widening conversion because it's a wider numeric range. Those are fine. Um, it's the identifiers. You can have um, many kinds of Unicode characters. And the spec, uh, I like this part of the spec, which is just a Java letter is a character for which the method <laughs> character dot is Java identifier start returns true. <laughs> and keep in mind that this is like for people, or it can be used for people who are implementing a JDK, <laughs> who are the people who are implementing the character <laughs> class. So this is saying a Java letter is anything you want it to be. <laughs> they do uh, specify a little bit later on that um, there, there's kind of a minimum bar that you have to at least have the letters A through Z, uppercase and lowercase, um, and underscore and dollar sign, but that's it. Everything else is just up to you to implement however you want. And they give the warning here. If you had read the, the JLS, you would see the warning that characters that have the same external appearance may yet be different. I, I must have fallen asleep through that bit. <laughs> <laughs> when they specify that and they say character dot, are there any like any yeah. characters inside of the character dot? Yeah. <laughs> there, are, there are not. <laughs> or that, there may be. I, I didn't put it into a uh, hex viewer to, to see. Yeah. All right. Class. I know. I, unfair question. Very, very different. Difficult. <laughs> Next question. Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> Does anybody need more time? Yes. Okay. <laughs> One more check. Anyone needs more time? No? Okay. All right. Show of hands, who thinks this will compile? We have very few people. Okay. And who thinks this won't compile? Everybody else. Better put their hands up. <laughs> the answer is this doesn't compile, oh. luckily. <laughs> Anybody want to tell me why? Can you extend enum or no? Can you extend enum? No. Okay. Maybe. I, I, I think, I think the, the, that crazy function signature is fine. You're just returning it. Uh, no, because it, it, they allow you to do stupid things. So I'm saying so that is returning an array of strings. So okay. we believe it will compile because they allow you to do stupid things. <laughs> <laughs> and you are correct. <laughs> So that this syntax of having the square brackets after the parameter list is fine. Those square brackets apply to the return type of the method. So th this method takes an array of strings and returns an array of strings. That, that's tr that those square brackets move all the way back over there. Yes. And this is actually one of the few places in the JLS where, where they tell you not to do something. <laughs> <laughs> There's lots of places where they have kind of like code samples and they have comments in there saying like this is ugly code or whatever. But actually in the spec they say, you know, this should not be used in new code. You can do this, but don't. The part that is bad is the first line. The uh, question extends enum. It's compile time error if the, uh, to, to extend an enum or any invocation of it. I have one point. <laughs> yeah, very good. Well, you, you have some partial points too, I'm sure. All right, next question. Anyone need more time? A little bit, okay. <coughs> One more call, anyone need more time? All right, show of hands, who thinks this will compile? About half, two thirds. How many people think it won't compile? The rest, good. The <laughs> no, voting never, twice gives you nothing. You can't voice twice. <laughs> I, I think you're wrong by default there. <laughs> if you vote twice. The answer is, this won't compile. Yes, I did have that many won't compile questions in a row. Uh, let, let's look at the different parts. So, uh, M1 and M2, these are both fine. The square brackets can appear um, after the, the name of the bar variable, that's fine. And unrelated to this uh, JLS part is that the type of the variable, you can actually put the square brackets touching the variable name um, that it's for, even though that applies to the type and not the, uh, the variable itself. So you can have them in both places. Um, one of the examples they give is this. You have byte, square bracket, row vector, call vector, and matrix with square brackets. That's equivalent to what you have below there, which is uh, two 1D arrays and one 2D array. Another part, uh, just to elaborate on the, uh, the square bracket brackets being part of the type, if you have this, the square brackets are touching matrix 1, and there's nothing around matrix 2, but matrix 1 and matrix 2 are both the same. They're both 2D arrays. And matrix theory is a uh, 3D array. The, the touching part is just misleading. That applies to the type, not the individual uh, variable itself. The other part, uh, M3 and M4. So M3 is actually valid. You can have square brackets followed by the dot 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 var args um, thing. 
but M4 is actually invalid. You can't have square brackets dot 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 followed by more square brackets. And the reason is because the, uh, the specification for the grammar, you can have the type followed by dot 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 and then the uh, variable declarator ID, which is just the variable name, but you can't have square brackets after the dot dot dot. And you, in the, uh, the variable name, you can't have them before the variable name either. That's not allowed. The last part though, um, M5, this doesn't compile, but as far as I can tell, it should be valid according to the Java language spec. So Java C uh, complains about M4 and M5 saying that the legacy array notation isn't uh, allowed, but this, at least as far as I can tell, this isn't a legacy array notation. Having the square brackets after the parameter list that I showed in the previous one, that's the legacy um, array declaration. So this should be, well, should be allowed, meaning by the JLS, you probably shouldn't write code like this, but <laughs> at least M4, clear case, not allowed anyway. Yes, question. Oh, sorry. If we were confident that M4 and M5 were not allowed. If you were confident that M4 and M5, <laughs> that's a fuzzy area. I'll err on the side of being generous and say, if you were confident M4 and M5 weren't allowed, you get the point, even though you didn't have full knowledge, but that's okay. I'll forgive you for that. All right, next question. more time? Nope, you all have answers. Good. Show of hands, who thinks this will compile? <laughs> a very few people. Oh, more people are joining in. I don't know about a third. And who thinks it won't compile? About two thirds? The answer is this won't compile. Yeah, you can relax. Uh, actually, anyone uh, who said it won't compile wants to tell me why it doesn't compile. So sure. I'm pretty sure you can't assign an object to a object way that subject array is. I don't think object array is serializable. Don't think object array is serializable. Um, and I'm not 100 percent sure whether you can put a finalized method in the enum or not. But that's I'm not sure about that. It's good. I'm not sure if you have a label with the same name as the class. I'm not sure if you can have a label with the name as the uh, the type. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe seems uh, seems promising. Yeah. So the first part, object array to serializable is allowed, even though object itself isn't serializable. An array of objects obviously should be serializable. <laughs> so they they are they're serializable and clonable. Um, the other part, this label here. That is allowed. Um, that's just a label before the empty statement. Um, also, the, the label namespace and class namespace is different, so you're allowed that there. Uh, it's a bit weird. <laughs> Some uh, more fun things you can do with labels. <laughs> Anywhere a label is valid, you can put more labels. <laughs> also, from before we learned that you can put blocks in many, many places, you can also label any blocks. One thing you can't do, which actually I initially tried to do, is label the uh, declaration statement, the object uh, array object part. You're not allowed to do that. That's not something you're allowed to label. You uh, actually going back to this question, if I didn't have that semicolon there, that part wouldn't compile either. You're not allowed to label nothing at all. You have to at least label the empty statement. Um, the part that you're going to hate me for a lot at first and a little bit less, the part that doesn't compile is the finalize method. Uh, finalize any num is final and you can't, uh, <laughs> you can't implement it. But the, the JLS does say, like it, uh, it specifically says it's an error for an enum to have a finalizer and the way they happen to implement that is by making the, the finalize final. But there's actually another reason why it won't compile as well which is that these two classes are also invalid. 
you can't have an enum with just a method in it like that, or with even you know a, a constant in it like that. The reason we have to go to chapter 18 of the JLS syntax. So an enum is the word enum followed by the name of the, the enum, optionally followed by things you implement, and then the enum body. Enum body is a semicolon. Sorry, a uh, curly brace followed by optionally enum constants, optionally a comma, optionally enum body declarations. Enum body declarations must be a semicolon and then the class body. So uh, it, it's valid to have an enum that is completely empty, but in order to turn that into something that compiles, you have to make it look like that. So you have enum question and then a single semicolon followed by the method, or if you want, a comma followed by a semicolon followed by your method or variables. <laughs> <laughs> so, two reasons why I wouldn't compile. <laughs> the winking girl. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Last question. Take all the time you need. Anyone want more time? Yep, okay. <laughs> One more check. Anyone need more time? A bit? Okay, another 15 seconds. Make up your minds. And show of hands, everyone who thinks this will compile. About 20%. Everyone who thinks this won't. All right, the rest, good. Anyone want to tell me why you think this won't compile? Dot my x. Dot my x, you think won't compile. I don't think that the type new anonymous object subclass will convince the compiler that and Don't think that that will work. Okay. Anyone else have other reasons? Uh, can we uh, can we like pass object to to, to int using auto boxing? That's my question. Can you cast object to int using auto boxing? Yeah, like an object to integer and the integer to int. I'm not sure whether uh, we can cast object to integer. Okay. No. Not sure about that. Any last reasons before I give the, the answer? Uh, the order. The int x is at the bottom, but the first statement there, there is no x that's been declared. And Richard gets it. The, what, what this question is testing for is um, making forward references. So um, you, yeah, th this doesn't compile. <laughs> and the declaration of a member needs to appear textually before it's used. So. Um, but basically everything except, uh, sorry, uh, you can't do that unless certain conditions hold. And those conditions are basically everything except what I have on line three. So the int y equals x plus one is the part that doesn't compile. Basically everything else does compile though. So the exceptions to that rule that it has to appear textually before it's used, um, that doesn't apply if it is on the left-hand side of an assignment. So in this case, x is on the left-hand side of an assignment. Even though it's also on the right-hand side of an assignment, that's okay because it's also on the left-hand side. You, you also are allowed to do it if you don't refer to the variable by its simple name. So question.x is perfectly fine, and y equals x is not fine. But you use the partially qualified uh, name there, and that's fine. So what is the value? Has, has x been in the short? To 100 at that point? Yep, you would get x equals 100 at that point, or sorry, w equals 100 at that point. And the last part as well, this uh, anonymous class where you are immediately using it, that is also fine. And this forward reference is also fine because you're allowed to do it as long as you are not in 
the same class as it kind of like if you're not in the innermost or yeah th this weird rule about that where basically by making a new class you're allowed to make a forward reference like this and the syntax of creating a new anonymous class and using something from it immediately that's valid it's very rare though because it's not very useful because you are only ever allowed to access one thing from it basically because if you were to have multiple things you would have to pick one to access immediately. If you assigned it to something, you don't have the type, like the, the anonymous type, because it's anonymous. So you can make a method in there or a variable in there and grab it immediately. But if you have two, then it's useless because you have to pick one to use. So, very rare. So it's just line three? It's only line three that does not compile. Everything else is fine. Yes. No. Hang on, line five. Line five, you are not referring to it by its simple name, so that's no, fine. That's not my question. Is that on line five, is the value of x 100 or 3? Oh, um, I would bet it's 3 on line five. But I. <laughs> I didn't. Honestly, I didn't even run these. I just checked if they would compile. There's a chink in the armor. <laughs> so, final scores. Let's, uh, did anyone get, <laughs> did anyone get over five? What? 0.7. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hands up if you got more than four. More, uh, three or more. We drank too much. So we <laughs> ah, a couple people that got three or more, nice. What was your score? 3.3, and your score? <laughs> three, three point what? Three point four, nice winner. <laughs> so three point four, high score. How many actually? How many people got zero point something? <laughs> About you know twenty percent. Okay, good. I think I've done my job then. Everyone uh, a failing rate. <laughs> All right, that's uh, the end of my presentation. Thanks.